Welcome to the EKG Guy, if this is your first time. I'm glad you could join us this week. So this week we have a 68-year-old uh, obese male farmer from Minnesota with moderate aortic valve stenosis. He presents with this EKG to us. Um, and so what I want you to do is try to go through these uh, things here over on the right, okay, to make your way through the EKG to your first time. We'll go through this all so you'll understand our approach and then make a final interpretation. When you're ready, restart the video and we'll go through this together. All right, so hopefully you had a chance to go through that. Now let's walk through this patient's presentation. So a 68-year-old obese male farmer from Minnesota uh, presenting with moderate aortic valve stenosis in this EKG. Okay, so what we have to look here and what we normally do is start with the regularity. Okay, and the regularity, we want to find waves or intervals that are consistent throughout to call it a regular rhythm okay so some of the best leads to look at are these rhythm strips down here in this case i would probably use v5 because you can see these r waves here so from one r wave to the next is called the r to r interval and what we want to do is measure the r to r interval so here's the next r wave so from that one that follows to this one okay here's another r wave to this so these are all R to R intervals, okay? And if you were to measure all these out, you would see that these intervals are quite consistent. And because of that, we would in fact call this a regular rhythm, okay? Now, if they weren't consistent throughout those intervals, then we would call it irregular rhythm, and then we would have to then look if there is any regularity to it or not, but we won't get into that here as there, this is a regular rhythm. So a regular rhythm, and we use that because there's a multiple ways that we can find the rate. Now, one way you can find the rate for both regular and irregular rhythms, and I would recommend if you just want to have one way of finding the rate is by knowing that from beginning of our standard 12 lead, so from here all the way to the end, represents 10 seconds in duration. If you multiply that by six is 60 seconds which is one minute, okay? And what we wanna do is count the complexes going across, multiply by six, and you'll get an estimate of the rate in beats per minute, okay? And you can either use this with P waves, or you can use it with the QRS complexes or T waves, and you would use the P waves for finding the atrial rate. If you want the ventricular rate, which we'll use here, we will use um, the QRS complexes or T waves, okay? And I would use the QRS complexes here. So let's go ahead and find that. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. And what you would do is put that 22 here and you would multiply 22 uh, times six, okay? And so you would do 22, let's just do this here. So one is 13, so 132 is our close estimate here. Okay, so our estimate that we got from that, 22 times 6, hopefully is 132 beats per minute, if I did that math correctly. Okay, um, and that's an estimate of the rate. So you're, again, counting the complexes and multiplying by 6, because there's these is 10 seconds, the strip that we see here, and getting an estimate of the rate in beats per minute. Okay, now we always want to know how to find the rate. You know, it's easy to rely on the machine, but... As uh, someone that looks at EKGs quite a bit, you'll often see that the machine is not always correct and will typically only give you the ventricular rate, at least here at our system here at Mayo Clinic, uh, but you, yours may give the atrial rate. It's hard for the system to pick up P waves, so that's why it's often not given. So another way, because we have a regular rhythm, we can find um, a QRS complex that falls on one of those thick lines, okay? So let's see if we can spot one here. There's one maybe close to that here, okay? So notice that this is falling close to it, and we spot another R wave, which is right there, okay? And count the number of thick lines between it. So one, two, okay? So a little more than two, and you would do 300 over two, which is 150 beats per minute, okay? Or, and then 300 over three, is 100 beats per minute, okay? So I'm taking 300 as the constant, and then in here, I'm putting the two, and three would be this one here, but it's much closer to this, okay? So closer to the 150. So if it was between these two ranges, it'd be closer to that, okay? We got 132 up here, so as you can see, that's uh, closer, okay? 
Now another way, because we're noticing this is a fast rhythm, is by instead of using that 300, what you would do is use 1500 and divide by the number of the small boxes. So you could do 1500 divided by from here until there, so maybe it's about 12, and then I'm not going to do the math, but hopefully it comes out to something near that, all right? So this approach where we're doing this division, okay, is uh, something you can only use for regular rhythms. So I just want you to be aware of that. With the faster rhythms or faster rates, we tend to use that 1500 to be a little more accurate, okay? So those are a few ways uh, to find the rate. Now the actual rate that the machine gave us was 131, okay? So I'll just put that here, and you can see that we are quite close with that first one, all right? If you want to know one way to find it, I would use that initial approach that we used there. All right, so let's move on here, okay? So next we have to look at the rhythm origin, okay? In this case, I like to start, so we're pretty much here, so our, this is why, I, and you'll see why I use this approach, okay? So here's the right atrium left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle. So I'm now asking myself, where is this rhythm that we're looking at originating from? Is it coming from down here in the ventricles? Okay, is it coming from somewhere here in the AV junction? Or is it coming from somewhere up in the atria? Okay, so those are the main ones I'm asking. I start kind of from the bottom off and I ask, are there any wide QRS complexes here? Meaning, is the duration of our QRS complex, so from here to here, wide, meaning is it at least 120 milliseconds or longer, okay? And if you look at our QRS complexes here, they're smaller than the three small boxes, so they're actually normal, okay? Meaning that we have something probably originating from above the ventricles, so that we don't have any intraventricular conduction delay that we'll talk about later, okay? Next, I ask myself, is it coming from the AV node, all right? Meaning that are there no P waves preceding our QRS complexes, or are they? And if there are P waves, are they coming at constant intervals throughout? So here you'll notice our P waves are these ones here. Notice that they're all coming at the same distance before our QRS complex, okay? So take a look at that here. So I'll underline these so you can see it a little more clear. Okay, so all these are pretty much the same, okay? Meaning that we have P waves proceeding. So that means we don't have a, a rhythm originating from just this area or down here. We either have something originating from the sinus node that sits up here, or from some ectopic focus here in the atria, okay? So we have some sort of atrial rhythm, whether from the sinus node or not, okay? So now we have to ask our note, do we have sinus rhythm present, okay? So is sinus rhythm present? Something very important, and I think often, you know, taken uh, for granted and uh, not really understanding why we do have that. So let's try to understand. It's all you'll see as our teaching progresses. We, the goal is for you to understand why you see what you see on the EKG all the time, okay? So here's the right atrium, left atrium right ventricle and left ventricle, okay? And you'll always hear me harp on that because so many of those introductory books, whether it's Dumans, Dubins or Thalers and all of those are, are quite insufficient, right? They won't help you to approach an EKG. They won't help you with patient management. And ultimately they'll leave you feeling inadequate in patient care, especially when you're presented EKG in real life, okay? And that's why that was my struggle, and that's why I've developed this course. That's why I walk through these with you all the time is because I don't think they're good enough. Um, they serve a, a very introductory purpose. Um, but yes, I can keep going on and on, but we won't get into that. All right. So let's understand why these uh, rhythms, whether or not this is sinus rhythm. So sinus node sits up here, okay? And what you want to know is that from the sinus node, you have an AV node, okay? Also in the right atrium, you have a Bachmann bundle that comes to the left side. From this AV node, you have a His bundle, a right bundle branch that depolarizes the right side of the ventricle, the right ventricle. And then we have a left bundle branch that subdivides into a left anterior and posterior fascicle. From there, we have our ventricular Purkinje fibers that the impulse spreads from uh, myocardial cell to myocardial cell and so forth. So that's how it works. Now, when we are asking, is sinus rhythm present? We're really just focusing on what's going up on up here in the atria, okay? So we said P waves are present, so that means that we may have a sinus rhythm 
present, or meaning when we say that, we're saying that the rhythm is originating from the sinus node. And that's our question here. What is the rhythm origin? So what I want you to do is imagine this here. Here's our right atrium where our sinus node is present, this up here, okay? And now let's superimpose this on here, okay? So again, we'll put our sinus node up in this area. And notice that the impulse is moving in this direction, okay? Because it's moving in that direction, imagine it going like this, okay? Now again, we're only outlining this area here, okay? And I'm not mentioning this this or this okay so that's what i'm focusing on there and from there we have to notice that the normal p wave axis in sinus rhythm is between zero degrees and positive 75 degrees so this region here okay and as you can see our vector is heading in that direction and now you want to know what leads sit in those regions okay so we know that lead one sits here the positive end we have lead avf down here lead two is at positive 60 degrees all right lead three is over here and then we have v4 v5 v6 avr is here and so forth okay so that's how it looks and notice that that red arrow this impulse as it's coming from the sinus node is heading in this direction meaning that these leads should see upright p waves and these leads avr should see a negative uh, P wave there. So hopefully that makes sense. So let's look at if we have sinus rhythm present. So what you want to do is look at those leads. So let's look at lead one. Here's lead one. Notice that our P waves here in lead two, if you look up, they are upright, okay? Almost blended here with our uh, T waves, but pretty flat T waves. So they're, they are upright there. You can see they're upright, especially in lead two. Okay. If you look down here, you, that's the lead that we were showing all those P waves. So again, these P waves are upright. If you look at lead three, same thing here. Okay, so upright P waves. But notice lead three is over here, so you may not always see it here. All right. Uh, and then we wanted to look over, and here's AVF. You can see upright P waves there. Over in these lateral leads, here's a P wave in V4, V5, and V6. And then AVR, which is this lead here. So if you look straight up, you can see that these P waves here are negative, okay? So what this indicates is sinus rhythm is present. So we just spent a lot of time uh, looking at that, but hopefully that makes sense. So we do have sinus rhythm present, okay? Now that doesn't exclude that we don't have a rhythm originating close to the sinus node from the atria, but generally speaking, um, that's what we want to see, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. And that's the approach you should take because if you can understand why we're looking for those, what we're looking for in sinus rhythm, not just upright P waves in lead two, which, you know, often case can work, but understanding why uh, you see that is important, okay? All right, so that's the rhythm here. Uh, so far is a regular rhythm, okay? We have a rate of about 130 uh, beats per minute, so fast rate, and then we have a sinus origin. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Now let's move on to the ventricular axis. Okay, ventricular axis. Um, I know some of you are wondering what we use here at Mayo. We tend to use negative 30 degrees and positive 110 degrees, meaning that this area here is considered normal ventricular axis. Remember, we talked about the P wave axis in this from the sinus node between zero and positive 75. In the ventricles, it's a little different, okay? So that tends to be the normal axis. Let me just spread this one out a little more so it's a little more similar. So about that region there, okay? And then what we have up here is more of a left axis deviation and right axis deviation or shift. And this would be a northwest axis. Here's north, here's west. So that's where we get that northwest, okay? Not many things hang out there, um, but VT or ventricular tachycardia is something we can see up there, okay? All right, so this is what we have here 
And so this is in adults. Remember, in children, they have more of the right ventricles dominating, especially towards the end of gestation, at around 34 to 40 weeks and up to that first week of birth. They have more of a rightward shift, the right ventricles dominating. But eventually, with age, we tend to shift more leftward. Okay, That way, if you have someone that has more of a left ventricular hypertrophy um, or hypertension and you're seeing more of a rightward shift, that should alarm you. Maybe there's something going on. Maybe there's strain from a PE or something that may be causing the right ventricle to have such a dominating uh, force there. Okay, there may be a bundle branch block that is also um, present. So let's look here. So here we have lead one and lead AVF. And we say lead one because lead one sits here and AVF sits down there. Okay, so let's draw it out here so it's clean. So lead one and AVF. There are many ways that you can find the axis, but we will use these because it's quite simple okay um, and let's look here so what we want to do is look at these leads that we've pointed out and we want to look are they mostly positive or are they mostly negative okay so what you want to look here is we'll look at lead one okay so lead one up here and we're pretty much taking this baseline oops it's a little above that actually. I kind of showed the ST segment, but here it, it's a little higher, okay, from there. And you're measuring the difference pretty much if you have this complex between this and this, okay? Is it mostly positive, meaning above the baseline, or mostly negative, okay? In this case, um, it seems like it's uh, almost isoelectric, meaning that it's almost the same above and below the plane, okay? Maybe a little more negative or so but i would say mostly isoelectric so if it was mostly positive it would go towards the positive end of lead one if it was negative it'd go towards away from that positive end okay but because it's isoelectric it kind of falls on this line so we'll leave it there so hopefully that makes sense now we also mentioned another lead here and that lead here was avf so avf down here again we're going to be taking this area here so you're taking this baseline. Notice you have this small Q wave there, but mostly positive. So if I were to draw that out, just so you can kind of see that. So what I'm seeing here is a P wave, a small dip for a Q wave, mostly positive, and then some something like that. So we're looking at this mostly, that's a small negative, but most of this is positive, okay? So in other words, we would go towards the positive end of AVF, okay, so towards the positive end, which would mean that our axis lies somewhere here, okay. Now, another lead that uh, we could look at is lead two, okay, or we can look at all these leads pretty much. So, lead here's lead two sits here at positive 60 degrees, okay, lead three over here at positive 120 degrees. So, if you look at lead three, it's positive, so we'd go towards the positive end of this. If you look at lead two, it's also positive, but maybe not as much positive as lead three. So maybe the axis lies somewhere in here, okay? In fact, the axis was positive 99 degrees, okay? So positive 99 degrees, so we said this is 110, the axis may be somewhere there, okay? So positive 99 degrees, still within our normal axis, so I would say normal, but with the 68-year-old obese male, maybe a rightward shift to rightward shift in the axis, okay? So it was positive 99 degrees. So this is where you have to kind of put your clinical suspicion and everything uh, when you're making a clinical decision, taking all this into account, okay? All righty, so next let's look at atrial conduction. This is where we're looking at the P waves, okay? Remember, my approach here is so we don't miss anything, Okay, and this approach that we've been doing here is something I've uh, created just because, you know, everyone has their own a way of approaching and some are better than others, but uh, hopefully you just don't want to miss anything. And so this is something that I've used that's helped for me not to miss anything. Um, and what I'm doing, just to give you an idea of why I do this, remember I said the atria, here's the right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle and left ventricle. I use this approach because I want to look at the atria, are there any issues up here in the atria, anything here in the AV junction, and then the ventricles. So you'll see that we look at the AV node or atria, AV, and IV.
Okay, so let's start with the atria. And here I want to focus mostly on are there any left atrial or right atrial uh, abnormalities? Okay, and what we will see here is that these P waves here, okay, and uh, so forth do not show any enlargement. Okay, so we are not going to go into the details. We've done that in multiple other uh, lessons. So there are no atrial abnormalities here. Okay, there's no enlargement of either the right or left atrium here. Next, we want to look at AV conduction and AV conduction. So if you imagine our complexes like here, we've looked at the P wave so far, so we can check that off. Now I'm looking in here. So in this region here, the PR interval. Okay, are there any issues there uh, that you see? Well, the PR interval here, which is, as I measured here, from this to this, okay, can uh, suggest that we have a slowing of conduction. So if you look here, you want to find a P wave. So notice that the QRS complex sits there and the P wave just about there. Okay. And that one big box is 200 milliseconds, which is kind of the upper limit of normal for an adult uh, patient. So this was actually measured by the machine at 206 milliseconds. So in that case, we would call this delayed uh, conduction through the AV node. Okay, so that's one thing to note. And because you see that consistently throughout, this is representative of a first degree AV block. Okay, no drop beats, uh, so we don't have to mention anything there, but hopefully that makes sense. So this is a first degree AV block. So we've looked at conduction through here as well. So, so far we've looked at the atria, the AV node, and now I want to look here at the uh, QRS complexes uh, as well as the T wave. Okay, and IV conduction, we're simply looking at, is this prolonged or not? And earlier, I told you that it wasn't prolonged. It was at 92 milliseconds by the machine. So there is no um, conduction delay within the ventricle, okay, that you may see with a bundle branch block or something else there. Um, so we won't mention anything else in this case, okay? So as you can see, we went from the atria, AV node, and now the ventricles, okay? And don't worry, we are not... Uh, missing any of the wave segments or abnormalities that we'll talk about shortly. So now we get to the waveforms, okay? And now we're starting to break this down into, and just so you're aware, the normal is 70 to 110 milliseconds of IV conduction. So that's why there's no issues there. So let's look at the PR segment, okay? So if, again, we talked about the PR interval, the PR segments at the end of the P wave up until this point here. And here we want to see, is it elevated or depressed at all? Okay, meaning is it above the baseline, elevated or depressed? And if you look here, we're looking at this area here. It's not really uh, so much. You can see kind of this, how it goes like that. Uh, and that may be artifact, a motion artifact. Is there on the limb leads, okay? Uh, whereas you can see V1 is pretty flat as the patient's on chest, okay? So I wouldn't say that uh, there is any PR elevation or depression that's significant here or alarming, okay? When we look at next is looking at Q waves. So Q wave, there's no Q wave here, but a Q wave would be something like this. So it'd be this first negative deflection. Remember, this is an S wave, this is an R wave, this is an R wave, okay? So this is the first negative deflection here uh, of the QRS complex uh, that uh, comes before an R wave, okay? And so leads that we can see Q waves developing, okay, are here in lead three. You can see that as these small ones, lead two, and maybe AVF, okay? Those are the main ones that we can see it. So, oops, wrong spot. So the Q waves, let's just erase this here. Uh, we mentioned in two, three, AVF, okay? So two is here, AVF is here, three is here. Remember, these are the inferior limb leads, okay? Now in the ST segment, um, the ST segment is this portion here, okay? From the end, from the J point or end of our QRS complex up until the T wave. Is it elevated or depressed, okay? This is where we start to see ischemic changes. So when you look here, notice that this is elevated, okay? Same thing here. 
there's J point elevation, and J point is simply this area here. That's the J point. So it's elevated in those leads, okay? And then you can see some depression specifically here. Notice in lead uh, AVL as lead, well as lead one, okay? And you also maybe see some depression here in V2 and V3 as well, okay? So when we talk about here, we can put ST elevation that we see in two, three in AVF. Okay, and it seems to be most prominent in leads three and then AVF in lead two. So three is the most prominent, and that is helpful when we try to localize um, these areas of infarct. Okay, and that's what the interventional cardiologist will try to do before intervening on a vessel. So three, and then we mentioned some ST depression. So let's just write that there ST depression and one and AVL. And then also V2 and V3 we mentioned as well, okay? Maybe in V4 as well slightly, but anyways. Um, and the other thing we want to mention here is the any T wave abnormalities. Nothing significant all with the ST segment, so uh, we'll get to that shortly. So QT interval, just so you're aware, is from the beginning of our QRS complex all the way to the end of the T wave. We use something called the QTC, which is corrected for heart rate, okay? Because heart rate has a big influence, and this was 528 milliseconds, okay? So uh, this is prolonged in a male. Normally in a male, it's less than 440 milliseconds, and females, 460. Uh, not until around 500 do we get alarmed, but this is uh, certainly prolonged, 528, uh, okay? So let's move on to, is there anything else present here that we've missed so far? Well, there is a f one thing that I want to mention, and that is that the voltage actually throughout the EKG is quite low. Now, normal voltage, and that's like the amplitude, meaning how high and low are these uh, complexes. So if I look at this from top to bottom, in the precordial leads, which are V1 to V6, you want it to be at least 10 millimeters. So less than 10 millimeters in amplitude is considered low QRS voltage in those leads. In the limb leads, which are these here, so these are the precordial on the right. Uh, so precordial, these are limb. Another word for precordial is the chest leads. Limb leads is less than five millimeters. Okay, well, in the limb leads, you can kind of see here that it's kind of just making it, but in the precordial leads, it's low, okay? And uh, so low precordial QRS voltage, okay, is one thing to note. Now I just want to end here before, I know we've gone through so much in this, but as you can see, the EKG really holds a lot, okay? Um, and I might start to discuss some of the things that we're doing here with artificial intelligence uh, that it's showing more than the eye can even glean on initial glance, which is quite remarkable. We have a few papers submitted, some that you may, may have seen in some of the prominent journals. But um, the last two things are transitional zone and the R-wave progression. And this is where we focus here on the precordial leads. Okay, and here we're looking first at R wave progression. Okay, and these chest leads or precordial leads are placed on the chest, so it really depends who's placing them, how they're placed, and so forth. And what you want to see in this case is that the initial R wave should increase in amplitude. Okay, so normal R wave progression is increased R wave amplitude from V1 to V5 or an increase in the R wave to S wave ratio, okay? R wave to S wave, so here's the R to S, okay? And you wanna see in this to go up and this to eventually go down, or at least smaller in amplitude. And as you can see here, we have the R waves that progress and slowly these R S waves um, have decreased. So I would say this is normal R wave progression, nothing uh, concerning there at this point with that. Now in terms of transitional zone, this is where we go from mostly negative complexes to positive complexes as we progress across the precordium. So again, in these precordial leads, and notice that this seems uh, maybe mostly positive actually there, but it is actually negative because we, again, I, 
this took a while to, to actually get, but you want to use that initial wave, and that initial one there seems like a Q wave, okay? So I would say mostly negative there, still mostly negative here, um, still mostly negative there, but then you see the transition here to this R wave being more so. Uh, in normal transition, so this is normal, is between V3 and V4. If it comes before V3, meaning that these complexes became positive before V3, okay, so imagine if this was more positive, we would call that an early transition or a counterclockwise. If it was after, we would call it a clockwise or late transition. All right, so we're already going long here, so I don't want to take too much more of your time because um, I know you have a lot of other things to do. So let's uh, start to sum this up. So we have a regular rhythm, uh, likely originating from the sinus node, and at a rate of 132. Okay, so just that alone should suggest this is sinus tachycardia. Okay, and then we mentioned a rightward axis shift. Okay, so we could we could just note here right axis shift, still within normal, but uh, we can say that in this adult patient, that may be something to for us to keep in mind. Um, we notice that there's no atrial conduction abnormalities, but there's delayed conduction here that was consistent and prolonged at the PR interval at 206 milliseconds. So we have sinus tachycardia with a first degree AV block, okay? Normal IV conduction. And then we did mention some Q waves that were developing there in those inferior leads, these ones here, okay, as well as ST elevation, and we see reciprocal changes in leads 1 and AVL, okay, uh, that's going on there. You also see some depression maybe in V1, but mostly in V2 and V3, okay, and what this actually points to is that this patient likely has an inferior MI, myocardial infarction, presumably acute actually, okay? You have ST elevation going on in the setting of developing Q waves, okay? With reciprocal changes. Uh, so I likely say this is an inferior MI. Um, that is acute, but I'd also say this is probably a posterior, posterior inferior MI, okay? And I'm just looking at this here, um, that these are likely suggesting that there is actually posterior involvement, okay? And what I would get from that or glean that we likely have an RCA infarct, okay, that's extending to the posterior descending artery, okay, as a result, uh, because in this patient may actually be right coronary or right-sided dominant, okay? So as you can see, I'm trying to predict where the uh, interventional cardiologist may intervene, and so it's likely right side involvement. The patient may be right sided dominant because you see the posterior descending artery involved, which is supplied by the RCA in the right dominant patients. Uh, and a little more advanced stuff, but that's kind of what we're getting from all this. The other thing is the low QRS voltage. Okay, specifically in the precordial. We said that it didn't meet it there in um, the uh, limb leads. Okay, so in all, we have sinus tachycardia with a first degree AV block with a right axis shift. Okay, posterior inferior uh, MI, that's likely acute, um, and this low QRS voltage. Okay, when compared to the previous one, the patient was in normal sinus rhythm. Okay, so this is a complete change. So we have loss of voltage, we have a new AV block, we have a fast rhythm. Okay. Uh, and one thing to note, when you have these RCA infarcts, that's the one that's supplying that AV node and may be a result of that now new first degree AV block, okay? Sinus tachycardia, maybe the patient's having chest pain or something that is contributing to this as well. So a lot going on here and hopefully that made sense. Um, I will leave you there with that and uh, I will see you next week. And thanks for joining us this week. I uh, hope you have a wonderful week, and I hope you learned something. Now, I want to make you aware of our um, EKG coding reference that many of you are already using, uh, how to get access, okay? Uh, so you want to go to this link here. So put in that link into um, your uh, into the computer, into your internet source, and then go to put your email address here when you get to that, and then you're going to use my password here.
to put in there. Make sure you're using my password every time, okay? And let me just erase here. So, so this one here, all lowercase, put that in and then click submit. Confirm your email. So check your email, get a con confirmation and you'll have access, okay? And access here will be this and you'll start to see that we have examples and I'm now adding videos into it. So this is an on the go reference, has everything you could possibly imagine uh, we use as we're building the course for our fellows here at Mail Clinic. Um, and so forth. So I think it's quite handy. Our techs are using it. We're using it for coding uh, here as well. So very helpful way to learn, to use as a reference and so forth. Okay. And you'll see a lot of the things we discussed in this lecture uh, there as well. All right. So a few things. If you thought, thought this was helpful, if you did, yes or no, I would like to know how I can improve what kind of topics you want please leave them below like this video if you find this helpful uh, and share with friends if you want more practice okay obviously more practice practice is on our Facebook page where there's almost half a million of you there uh, and thank you for your support we have daily questions trying to get back to you uh, between our clinics and making sure we're staying in touch. So uh, go there for practice. There's daily practice. I leave resources. You can find us on Twitter. Search the EKG guy. YouTube, obviously, uh, and Facebook. Okay, it's hard to keep up with all these things. So uh, find us there. Share with your friends if you find this helpful. Um, and please leave a comment if there's any topic um, or just kind words. We always appreciate it. And I hope you learned something today. Well, thank you for making us the largest, fastest growing EKG community in the world.